this August, Pastor Weaver and I were able to be at General Council, uh, the Assemblies of God uh, meeting for all the ministers, missionaries uh, from around uh, the United States. And um, we, uh, Pastor Weaver was able to be part of uh, a presentation for Africa's Hope. And today we, we have Randy Tarr with us who is uh, representing uh, Africa's Hope. And there is a project here where we can really truly make a difference. So um, part of this, uh, there, there is an offering response to this. And I just wanna tell you right at the beginning, listen, if you don't wanna give in this offering, don't give in the offering. This is not one of those we're gonna compel you to do so. But if the Holy Spirit would lay something on your heart, we wanna do what we can. But listen, don't, don't feel like uh, anybody's pulling your arm to make you give in an offering. We are a missions giving church. That has been our history. That's, that's, that's I believe, what, what makes, makes our church great is that we have a focus on missions and serving uh, people around the world, bringing the gospel to as many people as we possibly can. And our mission here, right, in this community is the same thing to take as many people with us to heaven as possible. Uh, but Pastor Weaver invited Randy to come. Randy comes from a long history of a missions family, and we are very honored to have him uh, come this morning to present this uh, project to us in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And so I want you to give a very warm welcome to our missionary today, uh, Randy Tarr. Wow, wonderful to see you this morning. I greet you in the powerful name of Jesus. I bring you greetings from many friends in Africa who have found Jesus Christ because of churches like New Hope Assembly who have been investing in sending missionaries to the African continent for a long time. I wanna say thank you. How cool to see these boxes up here, Pastor Jeff. Uh, I, Operation Christmas Child, wonderful thing. We have used these boxes in West Africa many times. In fact, I think of one incident that happened in a little village in the northern part of Senegal, a place called Injum, a place where there are no churches. There are many mosques, but no churches. But we've started a Christian school in Injum, and we used Operation Christmas Child boxes. And for the first time, many families heard the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank you for doing this. Hallelujah. Thank you for being a missionary church. Uh, Pastor Jeff was telling me earlier that you've invested in some water wells in Africa. Again, I've seen great things happen with water wells. It's in many places, it's opened the door for us to share living water for the first time. As we give real water, we can talk about living water, Jesus Christ. So thank you for investing in Africa. You are a missions church, and I want to give you a blessing from the country of Burkina Faso this morning. That's where I spent the first four years of my life. And in the Maori language, a simple blessing would simply be this, which means may God allow your goat to give birth to a cow. Now, if that happens to you, I would like the first picture, please. <laughs> but wow, thank you for this invitation to share about the need for the Democratic Republic of Congo this morning. Normally, my wife Becky travels with me. We are flying out to West Africa tomorrow night, so she chose to stay home. But uh, Becky and I have been serving as Assemblies of God missionaries in West Africa since uh, 1985. When I went as a single missionary, we met in 88 and uh, then went back to Africa together. We'll have been married 33 years later this month. That's a wonderful thing. Uh, God has blessed me with a wonderful wife. I'm, I'm not quite sure every time why she married me, Pastor Jeff, but there is another little African proverb that puts it in context. It simply says, Rawenga sans ki, which means that even an ugly man is better than a dead one. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Gladly the children look like their mother. <laughs> Hallelujah. But we have just moved to the U.S. after spending 36 years on the African continent, and we become the director of Africa's Hope. Africa's Hope is about resourcing the emerging generation of African leaders to bring in the harvest in Africa until Jesus comes. Africa's Hope was birthed in 1989, 
at a meeting of strategic African leaders with American missionaries. They began to look at the Assemblies of God work in Africa, which had grown to about 2 million believers, about 11,000 churches by 1989, and they said, we want to see God do exponential things in Africa in the next couple decades. They dared to believe that the church could grow from 2 million to 15 million. But they knew that in order to get there, there would need to be thousands upon thousands of Africans that would be trained and then sent out to plant new churches where there had never been a church before. It was at that point that Africa's hope began to be formed because we come alongside the African church when it comes to training. There's great revival happening in Africa today. And Becky and I have been so privileged to watch the incredible things happen. There was such a wonderful, firm foundation laid by those early missionaries who were sent out by Assemblies of God churches to Africa. Some of them, as early as 1908, even before the AG was formed, they were going and then they came back and joined the Assemblies of God and were sent out. And today we see great revival. Recently, Becky and I were able to attend the 100th anniversary celebration of the Assemblies of God in the country of Burkina Faso. And what a powerful church God has raised up in that country. How many of you know where Burkina Faso is? Ah, I see a couple of hands. I see a couple. Well, if you take the big part of Africa here and the little part of Africa here, come back to that big part of Africa and it's kind of right in the middle. Now you... You know where Burkina Faso is, and if you want to go there, fly there, you have to put in the code OUA, which stands for Ouagadougou. So anyway, if you want to go, let me know. I'd love to go with you. <laughs> but when I arrived as a single missionary there in 1985, there were about 1,000 churches. God had already done great things, but they believed that God wanted them to plant a church in every village in Burkina Faso. Today, hallelujah, there are 5,000 Assemblies of God churches in the country of Burkina Faso, well over a million and a half believers in those churches. God has come in a powerful way and visited that country. Can somebody say praise the Lord? And you have been partners in that task, whether it's in Burkina or some other country around the world, as you stand with Assemblies of God missionaries, as you pray for them, as you empower them to go, God is showing up powerfully on the scene. We're presently working Africa's hope with the Assemblies of God of Burkina Faso. In this last couple of years, we've expanded the reach of seven of their Bible schools. Right now, we are translating the Discovery Series that I'll talk about a little bit later in our discussion about Congo into the Maori language in order that over a thousand new students can be trained in their mother tongue to reach more villages in the country of Burkina Faso. I could talk about the country of Togo, Togo is just a small little country in West Africa at its widest point. It's only about 55 miles wide. And I went there as a child in 1970 with my parents. And I remember that when we arrived in 1970, there was only one Assemblies of God church in the capital city of Lome. It was a city of probably about 250, 300,000 people at the time. And there were a couple other evangelical churches. But most of the people in Lome at that time would have been animists, people who believe that, in, that spirits inhabit inanimate objects, and so you try to appease the spirit world. I remember going into the courtyard of many homes that would have an idol right at the beginning of the courtyard, and there might be some chicken feathers on it or some blood sprinkled over it in an attempt to appease the spirits. But hallelujah, God has brought great revival to the city of Lome. Today, this morning, they already had church in over 150 Assemblies of God churches across that city. Well over 40,000 people were in attendance. Can somebody say praise the Lord? God is moving powerfully in Africa today. Africa's hope is helping resource over 23,000 Bible school students on the African continent in 380 Bible schools and extension training centers. They are now today over 83,000 Assemblies of God churches on the African continent, 80,000 trained pastors, and 23 million believers in those churches. Hallelujah for what God is doing. Today, I want to talk to you about a great opportunity in the Democratic Republic of Congo. 
The Democratic Republic of Congo is the 12th largest country on the planet. It contains most of the second largest rainforest in the world. It is two-thirds the size of Western Europe. Now this one may be hard to believe, but it's 3.5 times larger than Texas. I always say that for my friends from Texas who tell me everything is bigger in Texas. Florida would fit into the DRC 17 times. I don't know how many times Iowa, we should have figured that out, Pastor, how many times Iowa would fit in, but a lot, let's say it, because I think Florida is bigger than Iowa. So it is, has the third largest population in sub-Saharan Africa after Nigeria and Ethiopia, well over 80 million inhabitants in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It has incredible natural resources. BBC reporter Dan Snow says this, there's limitless water from the world's second largest river, the Congo. Beneath the soil, abundant deposits of copper, gold, diamonds, cobalt, uranium, coltan, and oil are just some of the minerals that should make the Democratic Republic of Congo one of the world's richest countries. Two of its minerals that are highly sought after in this generation are cobalt and coltan. DRC has 60% of the world's cobalt reserves and 80% of the coltan reserves. How many of you have a cell phone? Two key components in every cell phone are cobalt and coltan. So if you have a cell phone this morning, very likely you're carrying a piece of the Democratic Republic of Congo in your hand or in your pocket or in your purse or wherever you keep your cell phone. There's great resources, but unfortunately, there's been very poor exploitation of those resources. DRC suffers from a long history of exploitation, first from Western empires, then from its own leaders, and in more recent times, from inter-African conflicts. The known atrocities started with the Portuguese discovery of the Kingdom of Congo. They managed to subdue that empire and then they began the human slave trade from Africa to many parts of the world. The Belgians jumped in on the mess when King Leopold took over most of the Congo as his private overseas kingdom in 1885. His cronies abused the local population to exploit Congo's natural resources. It was the end of the 19th century and the discovery of rubber quickly became a hot commodity in Europe and America for tires for bicycles and automobiles. Meanwhile, in the Congo, the Belgians used slave labor to harvest rubber from rubber plant trees. Many Congolese who resisted were flogged, had limbs cut off, or were killed. When Congo became independent from Belgium in 1960, it was ill-prepared to govern itself. In 1965, Mobutu Sese Seku took over in a coup d'etat that ruled Congo as dictator from 1965 until 1997, making his families and his cronies wealthy, but leaving most of the country in poverty. It was estimated that he was worth $5 billion when he fled in 1997. Since the overthrow of Mobutu Sese Seku, nine different African countries have been fighting over the mineral wealth in Congo. There's been war. BBC and World Without Genocide website estimate that up to six million people have been killed in the conflict in Congo since 1996. The conflict has been the bloodiest since World War II. There's lots of corruption in Congo. Listen to Dr. Dennis Mukwege, the 2018 Nobel Peace Prize winner awarded for his fight against the ongoing rape of women in the DRC as he talks about corruption in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mon pays est systématiquement pillé avec la complicité des gens qui prétendent être nos dirigeants. Pillé pour leur pouvoir. Pillé pour leurs richesses et leur gloire pillés aux dépens des millions d'hommes, de femmes et d'enfants, innocents, abandonnés dans une misère externe, tandis que les bénéfices de nos minéraux finissent sur les comptes opaques d'une oligarchie prédatrice. Corruption 
which has led to deep poverty. The DRC is one of the richest countries in terms of natural resources in Africa. However, DRC is also one of the poorest countries in the world. Because the Congolese people have seen very little benefit from these immense natural resources, the World Bank reports that the DRC has the third largest population of globally poor in the world. In 2018, it was estimated that 73% of the Congolese population, that's more than 60 million people, lived on less than $1.90 a day. Stop and think of that for a moment. $1.90 a day. You couldn't even buy a Starbucks coffee today. Displaced people in and around Congo. Decades of brutal conflict have forced millions from their homes, many of them numerous times. In the first half of 2020, almost a million people were uprooted from their homes due to new violence on the eastern side of that country. There's displaced people across the DRC, numbering more than five million, who live in makeshift camps and urban areas where poor sanitation and health care exist. War, displaced people, violence, corruption, illness, poverty. Is there any hope for the DRC? Yes. The hope is found in Jesus Christ and in his church. There is hope because there are African sisters and brothers who are willing to be trained and take the gospel to their own people. Spirit-empowered, biblically trained leaders are the hope of the Democratic Republic of Congo. There is hope because there are missionaries who have gone in the past and who continue to go and serve in the DRC. There's a long history of planting the church in Congo. The Assemblies of God first sent missionaries to Congo in 1921. The reason we have a church in Congo today that is poised to respond to all the chaos and devastation in their country with hope is because this church the American Assemblies of God Church has been faithfully sending missionaries around the world who diligently planted the church in the DRC. People like Joseph and Eva Nielsen, who served from 1929 until 1959, planting churches and training leaders, laying a firm foundation for future growth. Some incredibly gifted and dedicated single women missionaries served in this hard place. Gail Winters from 1939 until 1985. She was instrumental in getting the Bible translated into the Lingala language. In just a couple minutes, I'm going to talk about the importance of heart language. And Lingala is spoken by over 14 million people in Congo. And this woman played a key part in getting the Bible into their own language. Imagine if you didn't have a Bible in English. How would that make you feel? Lillian Hogan, 1944 to 1986. Peggy Johnson, 1970 to 1986. Joanne Butrin, 1976 to 1986. Other couples served beside them faithfully, like the Jorgensons and the Joneses, just to name a few. We could name many others who have faithfully served in this vast country. I'm convinced there is a direct link between what the American church through Assemblies of God World Missions has done in Africa in the past and the potential that lies before us today to impact the people of the Democratic Republic of Congo like never before. Today, there are 4,000 churches, 1.1 million adherents, and 1,000 trained pastors. However, there is still the need, desperate need for more trained workers. You heard the disparity. 4,000 churches, but only 1,000 trained pastors. That means there's 3,000 churches out there that maybe don't have a trained pastor who need one. Listen to Raymond as he tells his story from the DRC. Imagine a huge country, the largest nation in sub-Saharan Africa with vast savannas and deep jungles. This is the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the land of my birth. Our people are very poor, earning just over one dollar per day. Roads in much of the country are in very bad shape, 
Years of war and corruption have devastated my country. Today, it is one of the least developed countries in the world. But there is good news. I am happy to say that the gospel message is going out and assemblies of God churches have been planted in every province of the country. My name is Raymond and I was a pastor of a church for years before I had a chance to go to Bible school. However, my story is not unique. Thousands of pastors in the remote areas of my country have never received Bible school training. When I heard that a Bible school extension was starting in Kindu, I was overjoyed. In my excitement, I walked for three days to get to the school. Other students walked much farther, up to two weeks. But we were thrilled. We had never been given an opportunity like this before. The long journeys were worth every step for a chance to finally receive Bible training. We came to this school with very little. Rebel soldiers systematically destroyed Bibles during the wars that ravaged my country. So, besides my Bible that I buried to hide from the rebels when they came to raid our village, no other student in my class had one. After my Bible school training in Kindu, I returned home to my family and to the church in my village with a vision to start Bible school satellite training locations. With the training I received, I have been able to plant new churches in the surrounding area. The gospel is changing lives and transforming villages all around us. We want every community in our country to experience the redemptive power of a healthy church led by a spirit-empowered, biblically-trained pastor. We need more trained leaders to plant more healthy churches and bring the gospel to all the Democratic Republic of Congo and beyond. How many more Raymonds are waiting to be trained? Pat Hurst, area director for Central Africa, my good friend, has told me that there are hundreds and thousands of workers like Raymond waiting to be trained. They just need the necessary resources. Today's project will help us impact all parts of the country. There's over 14 million people in the DRC who speak Lingala. Once you leave the major cities, the number of people who speak the official Frank, Frank language of French goes down significantly. On top of that, many people have been to primary school for one, two, maybe three years. That's all the education they have, which means they're very limited if they study in French. But if they can study in their heart language, they can learn much easier. We want to translate the Discovery Series, which is a 38 series curriculum that we're using in Bible schools across Africa. A three-year curriculum that will allow students to study in Lingala and then go out and plant new churches where new churches have never been planted before. These students are the emerging generation that will be willing to take the gospel to the hard places, places where they might have to walk three or four days in order to get to that village. How many more Raymonds are waiting to be trained in their mother tongue to totally fund the project? And we've been raising money through 2021 here. We need $392,000. That would be translating, editing, typesetting, and getting the initial product into the hands of teachers and students in the DRC. I'm believing that before December 31, Pastor, this project will be fully funded, and you can play a part today. Scholarships are key to helping training in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We can help students from Kisangani in the north to Lumbambashi in the south, from Goma in the east to Kinshasa in the west. Today and during this year, we're asking for a total of $50,000 to be raised in order for us to offer partial scholarships to students as they come to these schools. There are many other Raymonds willing to walk three days or more to get to a training center. We want to help cover some of their costs when they get to that school. There's a great campus in the southern part of Congo in Lumumbashi that's in critical need of further development. 
The campus serves as an extension center for numerous campuses in the southern part of the country. It also serves as an extension site for the West Africa Advanced School of Theology, training students at the BA level. These that are trained there will be leaders who will go out and create new extension Bible schools so that we can continue to multiply until everyone in Congo, woman, man, and child has had an opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Your gifts will allow our team on the ground to continue to develop this campus so it can reach its full capacity. We're hoping to build a chapel and a new conference center where we're looking to raise $120,000 this year in order to push this project forward. Maybe you're here today and the Spirit is moving your heart to help with that Lingala project or help with scholarships or help with this Bible school campus development in Lubumbashi. Anything you do will help us make an impact in the DRC. The choices we make today will help us affect the destiny of many living in the DR Congo. Spirit-empowered, biblically trained leaders are the hope of Africa, and they're the hope of the DRC. I met Reuben for the first time in 1985. He was a student at the West Africa Advanced School of Theology in Lome, Togo, and I was a young missionary serving up in Burkina Faso. Little did I know when I met him the impact he would have on the northeastern part of Congo. In the late 1980s, deep in the rainforest of Congo, a Bible school was being built. When they went to dig the foundation for the classroom, they found gold. Remember, I told you there's a lot of natural resources in Congo. The students were excited. They thought that this would mean a better life for them, better facilities for the school, better pay for the teachers. However, the elders and the leaders of the Bible school said no. The gold would not be exploited. Rather, they were to cover up the gold with the foundation of the classroom building. They said, if others find out that we have gold, they'll come and chase us out with arms. They'll take our property. They'll take the gold, but they'll take everything we have, and we won't be left with anything at all. They said, we are about training people for ministry so they can tell others about Jesus Christ. That is where the future lies. Pastor Nongoyo was the dean of the school at that time. A few years later, in the late 1990s, when war started and rebel forces from other countries invaded, looking to benefit from Congo's natural resources, they came right to the school. All the students and the staff fled into the deeper forest to escape being captured or killed. For nine months, they held classes in the jungle. One day, a student would study the next day, he would climb a tree and he would look out to make sure there were never no rebel forces advancing on their school. The rebels took over that Bible school and without knowing it, they slept right on top of the gold in the classroom. Finally, they got tired of the location and left. The school and all the students and staff returned and they were able to hold a graduation. The school continues to train workers until today. Reuben and the students at that Bible school were willing to suffer in the short term in order to have a greater benefit in the long run. They made a choice to affect the destiny of many for eternity. The Apostle Paul says it correctly. He says, so fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The gold under that classroom building is temporary. The lives that have been redeemed by Jesus through preaching that has happened by spirit-empowered, biblically trained leaders who have been trained in that school, that is eternal. The seen is the resources that you and I possess. The unseen is the potential impact our resources can have on changing the eternal destiny of many in the DRC. Today, that church is ready. 25 Bible schools and extension training centers. Hundreds of pastors and students who desperately want training. You and I have an ability to help make a difference in the Democratic Republic of Congo. What will we do today that will make a difference for eternity?